Okay. Great, and we're live. So welcome everybody to this remote interview. My name is Lisette and I'm interviewing people and company doing great things remotely. And I'm totally over the top excited today because today, I mean, talk about companies doing great things remotely. I've got a totally special treat for everybody today. So we're going to be speaking with Brent Lassard and Tom Lambot from rloop.org. And we're going to be talking about the Hyperloop. So thanks, you guys, both for being here. This is going to be great. And um, a little bit, let's see, I always start the questions with, we're going to get into our loops. I don't want to, I don't want to jump right in, but let's start out with what do, what do your virtual offices look like? What do you guys need to get your work done? Uh, let's start with Tom. Yeah. So um, what I need is just my laptop. That's, that's, that's the thing, the great thing of our loop and the, all the crowdsource engineering world. Um, it's really just my laptop and if possible, either a whiteboard or a piece of paper. Uh, I like to take notes and, and write down all the time or just for equations or the sake of stuff you can do on the computer. But I can be in the train, I can be in a plane, uh, I can be at my home. Just as long as you've got your computer, you can get some work done. And Brent, how about you? Yeah, yeah no, it's pretty much uh, the same. Um, I travel a fair bit for work, so uh, just having uh, my, uh, my smartphone or my laptop with me um, permits me to have access to everything that we do on uh, our loop. So. Yeah, right. that's, that's one of the, the, the thing is really that because we put everything online uh, and like we, we never use email, <laughs> to be honest. So everything, we, we just go on Slack. Uh, so Slack to, to discuss our stuff. We have Google Drive and so forth. So that's, as long as you get internet connection, which is another important part of, for, for, I think we forgot to mention, uh, we, we can access everything from what we're working on. Okay, we're going to get into the tools. I'm a total tool junkie, so we will not skip over that. But first, we've got to talk about what our loop is and what you guys are doing. So I don't know who I have here from your website, which I really loved. Imagine a world where you can travel from Los Angeles to San Francisco in 30 minutes, which I've lived there. I've done the drive hundreds of times. It takes a good six hours. As, no, you can't really cut it unless you're doing something illegal. Or London to Manchester in 15 minutes. And then you say, suddenly you could live anywhere, work anywhere, and visit anywhere. So tell us, what is our loop? What, is, <laughs> what are you guys doing? So I, I really like the, uh, so San Francisco to LA in 30 minutes really talks to me because, you know, I'm, I'm an aerospace engineer. There is a lot of aerospace stuff in Los Angeles, yet I love the Bay Area. You know, we were just chatting before coming on air uh, about how it's great around here. So I would love to be able to um, work in Los Angeles or go see some, some aerospace uh, conference during the day in Los Angeles and just, you know, come back to, come back home um, in, the, in the Bay Area. So our loop was born on the internet in 2015, June 2015, there was um, an announcement by SpaceX um, that was basically saying, we would like to kickstart the, the R&D for the Hyperloop concept you guys come up with design and we'll select the, the best design and we'll race it down a track that we're specially building in Los Angeles. And just when that, that announcement was made, there was a message on the social board Reddit online and someone said, hey guys, let's, let's make a Reddit team. And a lot of people started to apply. A lot of people started to say, hey, I want to help. I'm a mechanical engineer. I think I can do something. I'm a web developer. I can make you guys a website. Or I, I don't really have any skills, but I'm willing to put like 200 bucks for you to help you around. So there was a huge boom. A lot of people were really interested. And the, the people started to self-organize. We started to have uh, to create kind of an org chart saying, okay, the team should be like that. We should have a project manager. We should have that team. We should have that team. And the people start from the internet started to apply and say, hey, my name is Brand. I, I, I come from Canada. I, you know, I would like to be project manager. And uh, people will vote for them. People on the internet will vote for them. And that's really how the whole thing started. So what did you use to self-organize? What was the... What, what, how did you visualize the org chart? I, this is all remotely. This is all via Reddit. People know each other? Yeah, so it was, um, like Tom said, there was a post uh, that went up and people started to apply and then it, it sort of started organically really uh, to form, but we kept a very sort of flat structure. So um, 
there is a technical lead like Tom. Um, I'm the project lead, so overseeing more the administrative side of things. And then we sort of assigned, so there are certain subsystems that we'll need to make this project feasible. Uh, so we, we broke off into uh, a dozen or so engineering-based uh, teams. We assigned leaders for each team just to sort of guide the workflow. And then everybody sort of just wherever their interest or their education lied, uh, joined those teams. And then you're not necessarily restricted to participate within a single team. So people who are working on uh, the PR side can also be working on mechanical engineering side, for example. So it's very flat. Um, it just sort of it, it just sort of organized organically, really, by ne by necessity. That's pretty incredible because you have lots of times with hierarchies and org charts where where people can't see the work seems to stop. And here it seems like the work is flourishing, and there's no it seems like there's no arguments over who's getting what role. It's sort how. What was it that you guys struggled with, with the self or There must have been something. So in the beginning, it was really, um, <clears throat> it was, I remember the first Slack meeting where uh, like a couple of days after the initial team formed over uh, Reddit, uh, it was a mess. <laughs> there were 50 people talking all together. It was the very beginning of the group and saying, okay, we should do this. And one guy wanted to talk about the logo, another guy wants to say, well, let's focus on the technical thing. So it's going every direction. The first meeting was really awful. I think we, we lost like 20% the first time. And, it's, and after that, you know, people start to realize, okay, if we want to make that thing happen, because the, 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 the competition uh, timeline is so tight, we need to organize ourselves. And as Brent said, it's really organically. People, they felt that there was a need for that kind of position. They felt there was a need to work in, in those things. And the, the thing that really helped was really to keep people focused and say, okay, this is what our objectives are. This is what we should be doing to go that direction. And from there, it, was, it seemed kind of natural, really, the way we should be working. Yeah, it was almost trial and error at the beginning. Um, we found out pretty quickly where, uh, you know, potential potholes were. And uh, we, we learned quickly to mitigate them and then, uh, and then use that knowledge to uh, continue our, our growth in a productive manner. And I read that you now have over 400 people working on your team, entirely distributed. So Correct. There's, there's no central office. Correct. Wow. So funny thing about that. Um, so at, at one point in the, the, the competition, there was... Um, something called the uh, design weekend. So you had a bunch of milestone to pass and then uh, you were invited to the design weekend in Texas. Design weekend was basically uh, um, a place with a bunch of booth and every Hyperloop team would be sitting and explaining a bit the design. And we were there. That was the first time that any people, people from our loop ever met. And it was six months after we all the, the big, all the work was done before, all only over the internet. Never, nobody even met before. The first two guys that met were actually Eric from San Francisco, and Amir uh, is, is our uh, numerical simulation lead, who's coming from India. He flew for 28 hours for the wow. design event. Talk about education, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, he, 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 yeah, he, first time people ever met. It was really crazy to see that, uh, because as you said, we have no central office, everything over the internet, yet we managed to do a very good job, I think, uh, so far. And so when we met for the first time, like, oh, oh, you know, I didn't expect you to be so tall. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it seemed like we knew each other for a long time because we spent so many nights uh, together working. But yet it's like first time we ever met. So it was really a weird feeling. So is this then a project? So people volunteered to work on this project in the beginning. Is that correct? Everybody was a volunteer. Are there any paid people now? No. It's still completely volunteer run. Correct. Yes, people are either students or professionals. They all have something on the side. It's a hobby. Uh, you know, they have a day job. I have a day job. Brent has a day job. Um, we, we really do this for fun uh, on the side. Yeah, everybody is passionate about the project, and that's their incentive to participate, really. Wow. And so what do they, at the end, what, what do they get at the end? High five. 
<laughs> and maybe the Hyperloop. <laughs> yeah, well, well yeah. everybody is uh, working to that end. So um, the funny thing about the competition is um, they've said that there is prizes. Uh, they have not indicated what those prizes are. So everybody is working pr primarily because they believe the Hyperloop is the future of transportation and they want to be a part of it, of realizing it. And they agree with our philosophy of being open source and crowdsource and taking that revolutionary approach to realizing the Hyperloop. Wow, so in the end, it could be that they get cupcakes and, uh, and a high five. <laughs> Pretty much, it's, it's, I think they, people, it's a cool problem to work on, you know, it's, it's a cool engineering problem. And it seems really like working onto a 21st century problem. You really feel like you're working onto like uh, something, it's, it's out of the ordinary, it's just new things seem so futuristic. So people okay. are always, you know, people are always interested in that. So if they can tell, I think it's something like I'm motivated for, it's, uh, it's like seeing later, you know, I actually helped a bit in the beginning when that thing happened. Imagine like 20 years down the road, if the Hyperloop is exactly what we imagine it's going to be today. I, I think it's also the thing getting out of that is uh, to say, hey, I was I actually helped that thing in the beginning. It's really proud of, you know, proud of what I did. And I, I kind of in some way um, helped a bit. And it just, and you need not one person to do that. You need a lot of different people that needs to come together to, to work that out especially in a short time frame. So that's, yeah, as Brent said, motivated toward the same goal. Indeed. So I want to get into how you guys work it together, but I still first want to really understand what is the Hyperloop exactly, a little bit more in depth. Because we know we can get from San Francisco to Los Angeles really fast, but how, that's, about, that's about it. That's about where, where my knowledge extends. So what is the Hyperloop? Okay. Um, so the Hyperloop is that crazy concept that um, SpaceX and Elon Musk came up with in 2013. It's based on work that was done in the past by other companies and by uh, the inventor of uh, modern rocketry, Goddard. Also. But so in a nutshell, what it is, imagine steel tubes in which you make a vacuum. So you move the air out of it. And inside that tube, you will have a pod which looks like kind of a train pod, except it's levitating. And so you are shooting that, that levitating wagon inside an evacuated tube at very, very high speed. You don't have any friction from the ground because it's levitating. You don't have or very little friction from the air because you're in low atmosphere. So it means that you have a very efficient system. You have something where all the energy is really used for traveling and not losing to heat because of friction and so forth. So that's, that's, that's the pitch. That's the idea. And so you have, you will have those tubes put onto concrete pylons elevated from the ground. And imagine one station, in Los Angeles, one station, in San Francisco, and you have that pod that will be um, electromagnetically accelerated to the, to the tube and just cruise all the way down uh, to Los Angeles. So potentially something as, as um, efficient, how you say, as convenient as a train, as fast as a plane, and still cheap enough that can be used for everyday commute. That's in a nutshell the idea. That is a long way from the Greyhound bus that people <laughs> <Yeah>. used to. <laughs> <laughs> the horrible Greyhound bus. Wow. So I think motivation. Sorry, I think the motivation behind the uh, the actually making that route in in Los Angeles uh, in California was because. They've been talking about the high-speed train uh, in California, which seems to be taking like 20 years to have something, just the plan approved and stuff. And, you know, I think the, there was some irritation there saying, there must be another way. There must be another way, just you know, even for that, you know, 20 years down the road means that the technology will be already passed when it's, when it's put in place. So there might be just a new hmm. way to do it. I think that was one of the big motivations behind it. Yeah, it's also... Um Based on preliminary analysis, uh, that, that California high-speed rail is estimated to be about 10, 10 times the cost of the Hyperloop and less than half the speed. 
is it why? Why are they? Is it just bureaucracy? Is it old ways of working? What is it that's making what you guys are doing so fast and so efficient versus? I mean, I, they've been talking about this line between <laughs> San Francisco and California as long as I can remember, since way before I, when I lived there. So what, what's the difference? Well, um, it's, we, we need always to be cautious with the numbers uh, because those are estimations. But the, the thing is, um, the reason we know the cost for the train is because it's something that has been around for a long time. We kind of know how it's going. Um, and every now and then in, life, in the history of humankind, you need a revolution with something. And sometimes that revolution might fail. Sometimes that revolution might just just the thing you need. The hard thing is that leap of faith to go to a new technology. That's the problem in everything. You need to have people believing, willing to be putting the money on the line and say, okay, let's give it a try. Let's see if we can make the thing. So in the end game, yeah, the, potentially the, the Hyperloop might be able to really reduce all the costs uh, by a lot. In the beginning, it won't be the, it won't be the case because – as every new project, every new R&D project, you're building up something, it costs you a lot of money for little return. But it's more about the big picture, looking at the end game. And at the end game, there is a high possibility of having that thing very cheap compared to other ways, means of transport, but yet being so efficient. Yeah, and we will, be, we will be testing that out. Hopefully by the end of this summer, we should have a functioning prototype. Wow. That is fast. That is fast because you said you started June 2015 was the first yes. post on Reddit. And then within a year, you have a functioning prototype. Well, Caltrans, take that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's really impressive. I mean, what I think is so exciting about what you guys are doing is that we, we no longer have to ask permission in order to do things like this anymore. People can actually gather around an issue that they care deeply about and do something about it without anybody saying no. I mean, you guys can, you guys can just do this. Absolutely. So it's totally awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great, um, that's, a, that's something that our loop is offering to people is to, to, to be able to participate in a project like this without having to need permission from anybody uh, and just being able to uh, volunteer or offer their expertise or um, their time, uh, you know, as it permits them. And do you take on new people all the time? Yes, or we do. It's sort of limited. So it's people, if somebody says, oh man, I really love what you're doing. I'm a rocket scientist, I don't know, what, <laughs> develop whatever you need. So then you evaluate. And who evaluates? How do you guys bring people on? Who says yes or no? So we, <coughs> sorry. So as Brent mentioned, we are open source and we accept people all the time on. Um, we, so people can just apply online. Still now, people can still apply online. We, we had to, because we had a huge influx of people, we had to put a, a, a manual, manual uh, process in, in, the, in the, the steps. So you ha we have someone manually approving them. The, the reason behind that is that we're trying to avoid spam. Uh, but other than that, there is no restrictions. We have people on board that have no real technical skill relevant, but yet everybody has a piece to the puzzle. And that's one of the, the key thing we really learned with uh, the, the R loop and all the crowdsource engineering is that even the person that seems to be the most, like, you know, I will never be able to use you. At some point they will say, hey, actually I can do this thing, you know, and it doesn't need to be technical. Uh, it's, it can be like, hey, I can do some kick-ass graphics. Hey, I, I know a guy that can make some flyers for our booth. For example, in Texas, we had guys say, you know, great guys saying, Hey, actually, I have some connection. I can some make some uh, merchandising, so like some mugs and some ba like banners and stuff. And in the end, it looks so professional. You know, it was like wow, mind blowing. And you have some people that working like uh, in in some of the teams with us that are focusing more on like the financial side onto the, the the videos. Some of them don't. They just know the basic pitch of how the the pod or our design work, but they just don't, they don't really know details but they have a role to play because they're helping us in other ways. And that's really the thing. We have never refused anyone to join. Uh, everybody's free to join, even if it's just to, to join and disagree with us. It just, you know, it never really happened. I think I had one or two guys joining just to say, hey, you should do things differently. 
and you know we listen to them and try to to do things but you know we cannot steer a whole ship also because just one guy says we should without giving any tangible uh, 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 proof but it just showed a point that we're willing to take any every input and every skills because they're Everybody can find their, their place. And we don't tell people, oh, you should go do that. When people join in, we have a, we have a HR team that, will, that takes care of the people, asking, saying a bit like, okay, this is, we have a welcome document now, which is something that I really need it. Um, and we can go in details after that because for online things, uh, the newcomer is a bit, it's a, it's a huge task actually. But focusing on, on the, uh, <clears throat> what I was saying, we have a short team taking care of the newcomers and say, okay, those are the things you, sh you should know. Uh, this is the latest documents we worked on. Um, if, you, know, you, should be, you should register for this and that. Take your time to look around the channel. So we are organized in Slack where we have okay. a channel for every, every uh, uh, profession. We have me mechanical, uh, we have uh, uh, electrical, we have a PR, we have a social media, we have something for everything. And so people look around and they say, you know, hey, I would like to be part of that team and that team. And we give them tags. Uh, the idea of the tag is just for us to know what people are interested in. It doesn't show what teams they belong to. They are a huge pool. They are not restricted to a team. They can join whatever team they want. It's just for us to know, okay, it seems like there is a huge interest for that, for that team. Maybe we should look into more people for that team. Um, but people are not restricted and people just, they come and they, they do the groceries basically. They say, okay, I like a bit of that. I'd like a bit of that. And that's, that's how they, you know, that's how they work. Mm. And we certainly have people join and do nothing. Just look around, kick the tires and then disappear. Uh, we have people that we call uh, shooting stars who show up very passionate, very dedicated. They work hard for a week or two weeks and then they just drop off and they'll say, you know, something's come up in my personal life and uh, I can't spare the time anymore and they disappear. And then we have, since the beginning, we've had a core of probably uh, 30 to 40 people who've been there since the beginning, who you can count on to be there uh, online daily, um, who really push the project forward. And then what, what we get asked a lot is how we accommodate the new people coming up to speed. Like Tom was saying, we have the welcome documents and all of that. But what we try to do is uh, break down tasks into micro tasks or bite-sized portions so that you could take them on uh, without necessarily having to be an expert in the, you know, the overall system or the current sta uh, state of the design um, that you can just sort of go along Trello where we uh, assign our tasks and, and monitor them. Uh, find something that interests you and, and choose that and uh, push forward with that. Okay, so we've, oh, sorry, sorry. go ahead. <laughs> I wanted to add on the last point that Brent said because it's, I think it's a very important point to, uh, to uh, overline, underline is to <clears throat> the, the micro work, so the, the art of breaking down complex tasks into smaller tasks is extremely important for online outsourced, uh, crowdsourced things like we're doing because if someone arrives and sees just a huge complex system, they're like, oh boy, where do I start from? Right. But if you're familiar with the system and you, you, you do a good job at breaking them into something, if they just see the task itself without knowing the rest of the system, they can still tackle that task. That's, that's where anyone can just jump on the task and work on it. And that's really the power and that's where you really you do the whole crowdsourcing part. You just you have all those tasks, all those people, people jump on any task they want and you can just pick them out. So you talk via Slack and you have files in Google Drive or documents and things in Google Drive and your tasks are in Trello. <clears throat> how else are you, how do you, do you guys have regular meetings? What does it look like on sort of a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the yeah. cadence? The, right. uh, the, the team leads, we have... Uh, a weekly Google Hangouts meeting with all of us to sort of catch up on the progress. Uh, Tom and I frequently have Skype meetings uh, just to keep each other in the loop of what we're, uh, uh, what's going on. Um, uh, we have in, in Slack meetings uh, in the teams. Uh, so we have like a communal Google calendar where uh, team leads can say, okay, um, often we, we use Doodle to set up um, um, the best times for, for the teams. 
uh, and then we'll set them up in our Google Calendar and I will blast an announcement once or twice a week with the upcoming uh, meetings. Uh, we use GitHub for a lot of our, uh, the software side. Um, for our CAD work, uh, we use um, Autodesk has Fusion 360, which is um, a, a cloud-based CAD program. So it allows us all to work on it simultaneously. Um, again, anywhere you, you are, you have access to a laptop, you can download Fusion 360 and we can work on the project together. Um, I think that's the bulk of the tools that we use, eh, Tom? Yeah, one more tool I can see is because uh, I have a slide in front of me on my other computer <laughs> with the stuff I talked about yesterday. Uh, Trello is a, is a big uh, big thing we're using. So Trello is a board where you can put those tasks, those bite-sized tasks. We have a Trello with uh, every team in there and the team will organize themselves and they put their task in there. So people can just say, they can just add themselves to a task and say, hey, I'm on that task. I will be helping on that task. That's another big feature. Um, we are using. Yeah, and a lot of them, uh, a lot of the tools integrate well with Slack, so um, any yeah, updates that occur get automatically uh, so notified in Slack. Slack is really the big, the big piece in the middle, you know, when, I, when, when we connect our computer in the morning or, you know, when we go back from work, uh, Slack is the thing we'll be monitoring. That's where the everyday chatter happens. It's our little office actually is more Slack. You know, think about it. Our central location is Slack. You can go on Slack. We have a channel which could be the, the cafeteria. It's called the off-topic channel. And just people talk about the latest stuff. Uh, I just realized that it's really like an office. And you mm. can have the, the aero department, if you work over that channel and Slack, you have people talking about the latest aero stuff they're working on. And uh, you have a, the private meeting. You have the team leads channel, the private team leads channel, where it might be like the... Uh, I don't know, directorate uh, room or something where people talk about the uh, higher level stuff. So Slack is really in the middle of the picture. We're using it for everything. As Brent said, it interconnects wonderfully with a lot of things. Um, Trello has, uh, can be integrated. And, um, <clears throat> sorry. And yeah, it's, and again, uh, we never use emails. I, I've been working in projects where this is just my point of view, uh, but I've been working project where you send email back and forth. This is an awful way to communicate. This is just awful. And some people say, yeah, you need meetings. No, meetings are an awful way to communicate also. I, I spend weeks in meetings all the time to get like maybe 20 person productivity. I hate meetings because people just make a meeting for anything. Say, oh, we should do a meeting about that. You do meetings when it matters, when you need to take a decision or brainstorm something important, not just to because okay, discuss about something. No, just, you know, no. So the way we do it is really slack. We discuss about the, the things. We make meetings when something, when everybody needs, when we need to make sure that people know what's happening, you know, like, okay, everybody understood that. And when we want to um, make decision on important point, emails are really used only for external communication. And that's the way I see the, f the future of emails is not to discuss about something internally. We everybody has at some point been in the, in the chain mail with some stuff happening. And what, what happened? You get like, you have a two hour, you have to leave for two hours. You come back to your computer. You see all those emails like, oh boy, where is the important part in there? With Slack, you can have the same kind of chatter. And then people will do like a ad channel when there is something important or just pin that message in the board when, okay, this is what we need to remember. Uh, so emails are awful ways of communicating internally. Emails should be kept only to get in touch with people externally or to give like reports, you know, uh, things like that, but not to work. It's just not efficient at all. Yeah, I'm an anti-email person myself. So I'm like, yeah, I go. But the one thing that people say about Slack, though, is that it can be so busy and there's so much signal to noise. You just have all these channels. I mean, you could literally sit in front of a Slack, you know, if you, depending on how many you have, you know, you're, you can literally sit and watch messages pop in and just read them all day. So how do you guys manage your productivity in terms of, in terms of that? Well, it's like Tom said, um, there are loose guidelines about um, what gets pinned or what get, gets notified to everybody. So um, when, like he said, when something important or relevant that uh, the team lead or Tom or myself needs to look at, uh, that's when we get pinned or an at channel. 
uh, and then we can just focus in on that. And then if anything, like Tom also mentioned, we have a private team leads channel. Um, if anything pops up, they'll bring it into that channel specifically if it's uh, required for Tom or I to, to look at so that, I mean, I know Tom and I both wake up and there's dozens and dozens of notifications that we have to go through. But um, uh, I mean, using Trello as well to sort of separate, okay, team has decided on this route, uh, we need to break it down into tasks. Here's the overall uh, card or whatever they call it and broke it, broken it down into the relevant tasks and then pinning the relevant Google Drive documents within those tasks. Um, it's, 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 it's been pretty um, conducive to the work that we're doing so far. How many time zones are you guys working with? I mean, are you all over the world? Are they just all time zones? Yes, exactly. And that's, that's a huge uh, benefit for us is uh, we, we literally work around the clock. So uh, Tom's three hours behind me. Um, we've got people in Africa, in India, in Australia, in New Zealand. So it just goes right around the globe. Um, uh, when in the evening, I'm, I can be working on something, pass it off to Tom, <laughs> three hours behind me. He can develop it further than pass it off. Uh, going backwards and by the time I get up that task or uh, whatever it may be is developed much beyond when I went to bed six hours ago kind of thing. It's already gone around the world and exactly, got tested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, really well, great. it's a great thing to see, uh, you know, sometimes people, you arrive in the morning and people go to bed and then at the end of your day, uh, when you know when you go back from work and you've been working for a couple of hours on an R loop and you see the the same person you went to see go to bed, you like wake up and say, "Oh, it's going. Oh, you missed progress and that." It's really really fun. <laughs> so it's rare that people say like, "Oh yeah, we have we have people all over the world in all time zones." It's a huge benefit. <laughs> I don't always hear benefit. Do you guys struggle? I usually hear it's a huge struggle to keep everybody on the same page. Do you guys struggle with that with time zones in terms of keeping everybody on the same page? It can, it, you have to know, and uh, that's a good thing with Slack again, is that you can see the time zone of people. You have to know, uh, you need to be smart about the way you organize and to work around that uh, time zone. For example, Amir who is in India, uh, who is, <clears throat> uh, who, who, um, who is uh, like for much like I think like 10, 12 hours difference from with me, something like that, 13 hour difference. So when we make meetings and when I need something from him, I need to know, okay, I have my internal deadline. I need to ask him before that time. Otherwise it'd be too bad. You know, that's, that's um, happens a lot of time when we have meetings with deadline, when we have um, um, sorry, reports that we need to document, we need to send out to SpaceX and we have a, a deadline. We need to, know that you know by the time we'll be sending the document like six hours before that that time europe will be asleep so we need to be smart about the deadlines and moving it a bit f before uh because it's uh yeah once people are sleeping well you won't be you know it, it's not gonna help you so, and i uh, think um i think as well sorry tom <laughs> it goes back to some points that we touched on previously um uh, breaking down those tasks into micro tasks and bite size that people can take on at any point. Um, communication, making sure everybody is aware of what's going on uh, at any given point in time uh, and proper documentation of everything that's going on uh, definitely facilitates that. I know Tom got the question last night. He was at, uh, he was giving a speech at a, a hacker dojo in Mountain View and someone said the, the same sort of thing. I've never, you know, teams struggle with bringing on more and more people, uh, but I think we we've adopted policies that um, that mitigate those issues, and and people come on and they they get they can get involved very quickly, uh, and there never seems to be really I mean I mean there are those odd instances where there's a little misunderstanding, but um, uh, the work for the most part has been I, I would say overwhelmingly productive. How did you guys come up with these sort of team agreement standards? How did those come about? Because well, I teach a workshop. I teach the Work Together Anywhere workshop. And one of the segments of that is creating a team agreement to get everybody on the same page. You know, what are your working hours? How are you going to communicate? Some of just the basic stuff that having that out of the way really helps. But how did you guys come up with that? What was your process? 
It's, it's really interesting, that question, because we might not be a good candidate for it because people, when we proposed the idea of like, oh, we should do it this way, there was no opposition. Everybody kind of agreed directly. And it's, so it's, it's, it's really weird. Um, but <clears throat> it seemed that everybody was agreed with it. One thing that we're trying to do is, you know, and that's something I always say, is try be open to feedback. So if we say something, and that's why it might seem that we had no opposition. They might have had people uh, saying, oh, we should do that slightly differently. And then, you know, we are so, we are getting very good with responding to feedback that sometimes get feedback and we just include them directly. Oh, yes, you're right. We should do it more this way. Uh, but it's, we need to make it reasonable. We need to, 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 we need to not be stubborn and put our ego aside, swallow our pride and just say, okay, this is my idea. What do you guys think? And if everybody goes within, within that mindset, if we don't have someone just fighting for what you think is right and everybody's willing to take some criticism and take a step back, then you can really work easily together. It's, wonderfully amazing how people can work easily together just seeing and again the whole outlook experience how people naturally self-organized and manage to agree to sometimes unsaid rules it just habits you take and sometimes we have to make rules that we had some problems a couple of weeks ago where some people were making some change to design without letting other people know so we decided okay what can we do about it well we are making right now central documents where Every, every team leads need to approve, like have a look and say, okay, I agree with that. This is our baseline. And if we want to make a change to that thing, we need to let the other people know. It's not like we are freezing the thing, nothing will change. It's more like, this is what we agreed on. And because it's easier for communication, we need, if something happens to that, we need to let other people know and have them agree also. And it seemed, you know, when I suggested that, people were said, oh, okay, it's a great idea. We should go ahead with that. And it just seems like it's, it's not a harsh sentence or a harsh, you know, something say, okay, we is going to know it's going to be this way. And it's more like progressive. And I think that's why it's going well. Also, you cannot make big changes in one day and have everybody agree. You really need to go progressively. That's not a big thing. Um, yeah, there was a, to keep a, a tight ship overall to make sure that still we, we set some goals and things. We walking toward that direction. Yeah, there was uh there was a definite learning curve at the beginning, but I think as well, uh, we have a massive pool of resources with all the eyes we have on the project. Uh, so very early on when we identified issues or shortcomings, uh, you know, you, you get dozens of solutions offered from the various people involved. And, and then the whole team, I mean, we kind of operate where um, everybody, regardless of what your background is, your education or um, or uh, your geographical location. Everybody gets a word, gets uh, some input, and then the team sort of rallies behind the best idea. And as a result, we've been able to sort of um, uh, emphasize the benefits of such a such a, uh, a spread out team, and uh, and definitely minimize the uh, downfalls. It's totally cool. Absolutely cool what you guys do. And I'm realizing we're reaching the top of the time. I knew I was going to go over longer and longer. I can't help it. What you guys are doing are the, is the epitome of remote teams doing great things. So I couldn't help. It's really exciting to talk to you. How many competitors are there for, for the Hyperloop? Initially, there were 1,800, over 1,800 intents to compete. Uh, at a certain point, you had to submit a preliminary design, and I think there were 1,200, over 1,200. Wow. Um, uh, by the time of the final design, I think they received 350 some odd uh, final designs and it was basically split. Half of them were university teams or um, there's a few high school teams actually as well. Cool. And then half were independent engineering teams. Um, after the, they invited 120, over 120 they said to the design weekend, which was end of January in Texas, um, at which point you presented your non-binding but your final design uh, to um, SpaceX, Tesla judges and uh, corporate VIPs at the event. And from that, they initially chose uh, 23 teams. 22 of them were university 
teams and only one non-student team and that was us awesome uh, following they invited another seven teams they said at the time we're going to review there's a couple other sort of shortlisted that we're going to go over their final design uh, a little bit more detail uh so they invited uh seven more so we're at 30 total including one high school team that's an impressive high school team indeed cool i mean that's i mean you know it's like that. You, now you don't even have a college degree to be able to work on the most futuristic space age projects i mean i just think that's incredible so there's 30 teams when's the deadline Ooh, so spacex <laughs> is providing the test track um they're building a one mile uh track um they haven't exactly finalized the design yet they are um they're they're being very generous in that they're um, accepting a lot of feedback from the teams whenever they have proposals for changes they're coming to the teams and saying here's the changes we're thinking of implementing um, you know take a week and uh, get back to us with your preferred route um, but as a result our design does have to remain robust enough to uh, be able to respond to whatever changes they throw at us uh, initially they were saying july i think uh, now it's uh, end of August to early September. And you guys are like, no, come on, we're dying. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, no we, still need, yet. we still need to build that thing also. So right now is the, it's going to be the next big step for our loop, which is <clears throat> really going from, from the internet to real life, going from theory to practice. So um, where our loop was excellent for R&D, all the brains at the same time working toward one solution, we need now to, to, to and we're working on it, we have uh, some solution to uh, bring the people together, find people more locally to be able to build uh, parts and, you know, build that part. So the, the, the great, that great power that we had is actually now a bit more of a, of a, of a, of a weakness. So we, we, we are working on to resolving that because, well, we saw it coming too. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, there is actually, you know, just again, I gave a talk yesterday, Brenda, and some people come and talk to me, say, hey, I heard about you guys two months ago. I'm, I'm a local. I had no idea you were involved in that. There are some friends of mine. And, uh, and they say, oh, can I help? Say, well, we need more people. And just because our loop has been popular a bit lately, um, I have a lot of people are willing to help. Say, oh, come in. I can, I can help you build stuff and all. So we'll see how it goes. But we have a... It, it's just a matter now. It's a new exercise for us. And it's going to be an interesting thing to see how cross source engineering comes back to reality and to actually build a thing. We yeah. saw in the design weekend that we can achieve great thing with even remotely and, you know, get something uh, concrete done. Um, and now we, that's, that's the, the path we are going to just to build that thing. Yeah. We're, we're adopting a, a similar uh, strategy to our tasks where we break them down into micro bite-sized tasks um, i mean we have a lot of members spread out around the world who have access to some very specialized equipment or who are very knowledgeable in certain areas uh, and so we're hoping to leverage that by uh, adopting sort of a micro man manufacturing policy um, where where small subsystems or components can be manufactured or prepared remotely and then uh, packaged and sent to a central assembly or final manufacturing uh, facility. So by taking that approach as well, um, we, we still don't really need a, a footprint anywhere. We, you know, we're going to, uh, we've got a couple small facilities in mind in the uh, San Francisco area for uh, final manufacturing and assembly, but uh, the bulk of the subsystems will probably be manufactured elsewhere and then shipped to that final assembly facility. Awesome. Totally great. Oh, I could go on and on. We'll get, we, but we have to end at some point, and we'll definitely do a part two once we get closer to the deadline. Um, just to. to hear how the manufacturing went. I mean, we've got to know. We've got to know. But um, if people want to get involved, I saw that there was a crowdfunding campaign that you're doing on Indiegogo, so people can donate money, and that's just help the whole thing. There's obviously costs involved, and you have to build it now, so I'm assuming there's costs there. So where? what's the best way for people to get involved, and where should they go? So... Most, I should ask. So three ways you can, people can help us. The first one, as you said, is to contribute to the Indiegogo campaign. 
So you can go to indiegogo.com and just look for our loop and you'll see our uh, crowdfunded um, uh, crowdfunding campaign. And we are, we have perks with, uh, with, uh, mer uh, with uh, uh, mugs, uh, shirts, uh, flight jackets, levitating pot for your desk, a lot of, <laughs> lot of little cool stuff. So uh, drop by the crowdfunding campaign and you know, the contribution can be as low as 10 bucks. All the money is going toward uh, building the pod. So we haven't spent any real money. Uh, I mean, we spent some real money, but it's more like it was contribution from just from our pocket directly. But no, we're talking about higher, like bigger costs. So we need, that's why we need the crowdfunded campaign. Everything is going into the pod. And it, uh, it, it ties in with our philosophy of the crowdsourced engineering and open source. And so we wanted to involve uh, a crowd who were uh, emotionally and potentially financially invested in the project. The second way to help us is to jo join the team. Uh, go to rloop.org and there is a form you can fill and uh, you will have to, 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 to sign in and it will, may take a couple of days. As I said, we have, a, we have some people uh, checking every entry to so check it's not a spam um, or multiple entry. So uh, you can join. So everybody can join. You can stop by, see you know, if you feel like, if you have a, a skill set that you, you feel you can help or just want to drop by and see a bit how it goes. And if you, if you find something, hey, I can actually help for that, you know, or just you know, stop by and then you, you see it's not for you and you leave, that's fine. It's open source, everybody can join and we can have a look. Uh, we're really open. Um, the third way to contribute, and that's more for the people in California and uh, Silicon Valley. As we discussed, we're looking for some more people to build a team, so we're trying to build, to create a building team here in California. It can be Southern California, Northern California. We have people on both, and I'm more in the Northern California side, but I have uh, our manufacturing lead is in uh, the Southern California, so we're both doing it. Uh, we're trying to get more people that, that have uh, either access to machine shop, that are willing to help like over the weekend and you know, build stuff, crack, you know, crunch some wrenches. And uh, we're also looking for some locations where like hangars or yeah, hangar type or stuff like that where we, we could have one of the assembly or micro manufacturing facility there. So if people um, are, know someone that might be interested in, in joining the team or have some f space they would be able to, uh, you know, to, to lend us, um, just send us an email, contact at rloop.org or just join the rloop.org to the website and get in touch with us saying that, you know, you want to be, you'd be interested in helping out the manufacturing team for our loop. Cool. Well, I have a bunch of friends back in California and if they love me, they are listening to my podcast. So <laughs> hopefully some of them will hear this. And I know some of them have warehouse spaces. So I'll definitely be sending them this episode hey. to see. So I, I wish you guys the best of luck. I think this is really exciting and, uh, and congratulations on what you're doing. It's really cool. Thanks really a lot for talking to me today. Thanks Thank for having us. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. Until next time, be powerful.